Tonight I'm going to share with you what happened to me some years ago now that led me to reflect on how we experience and treat emotional pain. It wasn't that I was depressed, I, I hardly knew how I felt, because I self-medicated a lot. Pills and powders seem to, I don't know, cheer me up. I began taking antidepressants to help get me out of the loop, a behavioural glitch that meant each time I had the chance to get what I wanted in life, I'd spoil it. to ruin a chance, to miss the boat, to not show up or get too wasted to speak. I thought antidepressants might help break that chain. It wasn't that I was depressed. I had a good education. In fact, I'd say in that respect I was privileged. And yet, I found myself at different times on heroin, penniless, sometimes homeless, on crack, on the game, in jail, in squats with rats, with crazy violent men and women. Why? And could I ever change? Medicated, I drifted about these anxieties and worried less about my lifestyle. So I began taking antidepressants. occurred in shockingly quick succession, I buffered myself by increasing the dose. It wasn't that I was depressed. You've been on medication for five years. I won't prescribe any more unless you agree to psychotherapy. I tried it. It didn't work. She just sat there in silence and was really judgmental and cold. I'm suggesting group therapy. I can't open up in a group. Sounds like AA. It's just not me. You're lucky it's available. Most people can't access it. Well, then let somebody else access it. I'm fine as I am. Then why the medication? I won't prescribe these forever. So, I filled in the forms and kept taking the pills, and many, many months later, it began. So, this is a weekly group with no fixed end date. Please read out and respect the following ground rules. I have agreed, agreed to keep everything said in the group strictly confidential. I agree to keep the names of group members confidential. All events, characters and names have been changed. A bit. I agree to have no contact with group members outside of the sessions. Any similarity to actual events or real persons, living or dead, is purely because this is based on real life. <laughs> I agree we not to pressure group members, members to participate. participate. I have the, the right, right to refuse to answer questions, questions yet, yet I understand I will benefit more if I participate. By the eighth session... Shut up! We'd started to know one another. You just won't face the truth. You're not the therapist. It's group therapy. We all get a say. Keep out of it with you for once. For once? What's that supposed to mean? You always butt oh, in. It's called conversation, dear. Oh, dear, you sound like my mother. Oh, not your mother again. What? She's all you ever fucking talk about. Come along now. Leave me alone. This is getting quite heated. Let's mm. have a few seconds quiet. Luke, such a know-all. You sound like a ten-year-old. You're very superior for an ex-hooker. I shared that in trust. Anyway, so what? I didn't mean it. Uh, OK, OK, what's this all about? How did this start? Luke was giving me a hard time. I just told her to get a life. Well, that's good coming from you. My life might be shit, but at least it's me own. Well, that's debatable. You get the runaround from your ex nearly the whole time. OK, can we just stick with the original issue that upset Amy? Amy, what was it about? He said I might as well not be alive, which is how I feel anyway. I meant she's a mother's porpoise and she has to cut the strings. Well, if, as you say, there are strings, do you think that they can just be cut? It's not that simple, Luke. I wish I could just cut them. If you cut a puppet strings, it collapses on the ground. So you're calling me a puppet too? <laughs> Changes can be made slowly, Amy. Feeling like you want to change is just the beginning and it's something we can all work on together as a group, all right? 
Look, I didn't mean to have a go. I was trying to help you. I know I can be a twat. I'm sorry. You were becoming defensive there, Luke, and you were having issues about Amy's maternal relationship. Any idea what? It's not about my mother, if that's what you're saying. But yeah. Now I've come to think of it, yeah, Mary did pull my strings for years and I've still not managed to cut them, even though bleeding well tried, which just goes to show I don't know what I'm talking about. So, how have people been this week? I managed to avoid <coughs> total disaster for once. Well done. Stay home, did you? That's what I generally do these days, unless Mary has one of her medical emergencies. You've got to stop me out, Lukey. I'm sick. I'm really sick. Look, I don't want to see the dealer. I don't do drugs Please anymore. Give me the cash. I can't keep doing this. I'm dying, Luke. You know what it's like. Think of all the times I sorted you out. I had nothing, but I always came through for you. Look, look, I need to move on. So we are right here. I'll stand you right that. I know you're no. really. Oh, come on, Luke. No one cares about me like you do. I need you. Please, I wouldn't be on the gear if it wasn't for you. That is not true. Now that you're clean, you think you can let me rot when well, you're going bitch about me to your therapy group. I know you better than they do. Look, love, I just need to sort my life yeah, out. Yeah, just like every other time. Go on, score some gear. You know you want some too. I managed to stay off the gear all week, and I'm going to cut down on my medication. Do you really feel ready to do that? I do, as a matter of fact. Well, my doctor's not convinced, but he doesn't know everything, does he? So, I'm going to do it. OK, well, I'd rather you had your doctor's support. <laughs> He'd keep me on forever, he would. Don't worry, I won't just suddenly stop. I know the dangers. Well, the medication has supported you a long time now, Luke, so this needs to be done slowly and with care. Antidepressants stop me from trying to kill myself. I might not be here without them. Listen. My partner Jenny still takes them, hopefully not just to cope with me. I'm off them now, though. They made me feel sick. Do you know what? I was taking them and still tried to talk myself, so what's that saying? If suicidal feelings come up again, Amy, you can bring them here to the group. And Luke, take care coming off the medication and please keep us informed of your plans. I say I shouldn't be in this group. I've never tried to kill myself. But you are in this group, Danielle. There's other ways of killing yourself. Some people take the slow route. I'm not doing that either. I'm here because the doctor wouldn't prescribe any more meds otherwise. And you take the medication because? I keep messing my life up. But you take other drugs, yeah? Yeah, but recreationally. You see? The slow route. I do drugs because it's fun, not because I want to die. You can't like living very much if you have to get wasted all the time, and believe me, I should know it's that. It's not all the time. Well, not lately. Have you ever fucked up? Yeah, once I, I had a seizure and nearly went into a coma. And she still takes drugs. I rest my case, Your Honour. This is quite revealing, Danielle. You've mentioned before that your sex work was often dangerous, so this does raise the question of how much you value your life. Yeah, I'd already let slip that I used to sometimes make late night visits to unknown punters, clients I should say, when I was high. And yeah, I'd been treated badly a few times. And a girl I knew, well, she was actually killed. Risk was an occupational hazard, like loads of jobs. And the overdose was an accident. Shit happens. She's pushing the look. Isn't that right, Stephen? What? I'm oh, sorry. Where are you, Stephen? You seem absent. I don't feel like have anything to add just now. Are you all right? Yes, I just... Never mind. Well, you're used to one-to-one -to -one therapy, aren't you? Eh? I mean, you're not used to just being part of a group, are you, mate? No, no I, I'm not. No pressure, then. Mm. Take your time. No one's waiting for you to jump in. Well, it sounds like you are pressuring him. I'd just like him to get involved for once. Leave him alone. Well, pressurising people doesn't help. But he doesn't say a fucking word. He just sits there looking down his fucking nose. Stephen! Don't go, Stephen. Uh, excuse me. Well done, Luke. Well, you talked about him like he wasn't oh, All the way you said don't go was really bossy. Why do you think he'd listen to you? I'll give it a rest, Amy. I just didn't want him to run off. Still, he may as well not be here most of the time. He's weirdly quiet. I think he's not used to being with people. Well, he's not making a very good job of it, is he? For the one hour a week when he could come and muck in and mingle, off he goes alone. Well, maybe not the social life he had in my day. <laughs> Stephen is upset and won't be coming back till next week. So, what happened? They talked about him like he wasn't there. Well, you were insensitive, Luke. I just want him to fucking well join in for once! Okay. How do others feel about that? I think he's shy. Well, he makes me uncomfortable. I'm showing really personal stuff here, and he says nothing about himself. I feel cheated, and I never know what he's thinking. I do. 
He's judging the posh twat. He sits there looking down his fucking nose, saying nothing. I can feel him looking at me because of the drink and the drugs and that. Well, considering he rarely speaks, where'd you get this idea? <laughs> <laughs> I can sense it. Or perhaps his silence makes him a blank page on which you're projecting your own expectations. No, I can feel it from him. Maybe you can feel it from you. Maybe you're judging yourself. Oh, spare me the pocket book psychology. A few therapy sessions and everyone's a fucking expert now. Oh dear, that home truth, was it? Okay, fucking Miss Marple. You read me. Go on, you tell me how you can read me. You've become defensive, Luke? Any idea why? Yeah, I don't fucking like it. Well, how do you know if you like him or not? Do you think he looks down on you? See, you feel it too. No, not really. <laughs> I know what you're getting at. You're trying to say that I'm imagining that he's looking down on me when really I'm looking down on myself, which I do. But I'm telling you, he thinks he's too good for us. Well, we can't know what he thinks until we ask him, but it is interesting you're making these assumptions. Well, I do know I have a low opinion of myself. Who wouldn't? There you go again. Well, of course people look down on me. I'm a fucking mess, I always have been. I'm like your bottom rung. None of us looks down on you. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I know that, which is new. But that's why I know I am right about him. Well, let's keep an open mind about what Stephen may or may not be thinking until next week when he can speak for himself. I know it sounds funny, but it sounds like you want him to look down on you just because it's just what you're used to. Well, my whole family treated me like shite, so maybe it's <coughs> a self-fulfilling prophecy. I make myself into someone that I think people are looking down on because really, deep down inside, I know I'm shite myself. I do, but I can't change that. No, no, no. I am better. A shower, a shaver, come here. But I'm still a fucking disaster. So are you saying you behave in ways that will get that reaction? So that's why you behave like that? So you expect yeah. to be looked down on? Yeah. Exactly. But mainly, I look down on myself. Until the day I die. But, Luke, you've already said you're starting to feel better. You've smartened up. Come here, stop using heroin. Why do you think that things can't keep improving? Because to change, to really change deep down inside, impossible. <laughs>
Last week was quite dramatic with Stephen walking out. Shall we revisit some of the feelings expressed after he left? Anyone? Well, the fact you never speak makes me uncomfortable. We're sharing and you're not. It's not that I'm secretive. I just have difficulty joining in. I'm sometimes slow to express myself. It took a long while to speak, even in one-to-one -one therapy, and being in a group is a whole new experience. Well, I feel you're judging me. He thinks you look down on him. I can speak for myself, thank you very much, Amy. <coughs> I think you look down on me. <laughs> but I'm, I'm in awe of you. You're so confident and you speak in the group so easily. You've taken the piss. How can anyone be in awe of a twat like me? You do have the gift of the gab. Oh, that's something you just learn to get by. You seem very bright and very quick. Are you taking the mickey? This is too much. Are you messing about? Can you not accept praise, Luke? I've never had very much of it, to be honest. Well, well, Stephen, who you thought was looking down on you, is in fact complimenting you. Would you like to sit with that for a while? <laughs> suppose. <laughs> Stephen, you were talking about your difficulty joining in. Each week, I, I swear I'll speak. I do have things I want to say, but then the moment passes, the conversation moves on, and then it's too late. It's embarrassing. You all seem so comfortable here. Comfortable? I was nervous each time I opened my mouth at first. I still sit here quaking sometimes. Really? I wouldn't have known. You're quite, um, candid. It's nerves. Mostly I'm terrified and things come out all wrong. Does that reassure you, Stephen? I'm reluctant to be reassured by anyone else's suffering, but it helps knowing it's not just me. I've been isolated most of my life, so being an, in a group is uh, overwhelming. Isolated? My father was in the military. We moved around a lot, and growing up I was always the new boy in school. Didn't fit in. Never made any friends. Nobody came to the house. My mother was uh, unstable. How do you mean? More nervous, temperamental. Abusive. And your father? Away a lot, mercifully. <clears throat> he was very aggressive. He couldn't accept that I wasn't macho like him and didn't want to be. Where did you get that black eye? Someone at school oh, don't me. fuss over it, woman, or you'll get one too. Someone at school, was it? Ah, oh, you poor little thing. What are you, a bloody girl? Can't you stand up for once for your stupid life, eh? I'll, I'll, I'll just go and hang out the washing. Don't be an idiot, woman. It's like a fucking monsoon out there. Now you need to toughen up, my lad, or you'll go weak and soft in the head like your stupid mother here. And see, you've set your father off again. Oh, shut up, you moronic cow. And you, Pansy, come with me before you feel the back of my hand. Would you like to speak more about this, Stephen? It's something I've covered quite deeply in one-to-one -one therapy. You don't talk about your family, Luke. It's a very good reason for that. Which is? They're not very interesting. I'm interested. Me too. Well, don't be. Oh, come on, Luke. You can't bully people into opening up. Oops, that was me breaking one of the ground rules. Luke may not want to speak about his family just now. I don't have a family. Are they dead? They are to me, so drop it. Oh, suit your bloody self. Stephen, it's nice you've started to speak up a bit more. Well, I I've realised I want to get all I can for this process, so I'll have to jump in, like Luke said, and not be afraid of being laughed at. Why would we laugh at you? Well, I'm not very confident with people, but plus I'll probably say something stupid because I'm still a bit foggy from the ECT I had a while back. Electric shock therapy? Who knew that they still did that? I had it when I was sectioned, though. I was desperate. Bloody hell, and that's what it does, it leaves you foggy. Absolutely. And it causes memory loss, <laughs> which could be a good thing in some ways. I could do with a bit of that. Hear, <laughs> hear, yeah, yeah. Well, what was it like? 
of it. There was something nice about it, actually. After a few treatments, it felt like the sun was rising inside of me after an endless and bleak winter. Well, that's very poetic <laughs> for something so barbaric. But at the time, I was constantly thinking of suicide. The sunshine thing did wear off, though. It's a brutal treatment, really. They don't even know how it works. Every time it's done, you have a, a general anaesthetic, which can't be good for the health. But at the time, just being put to sleep seemed like such a gift. I, I've actually had more progress from psychotherapy, but it wasn't available to me then. Um, <coughs> um, I think um, I think I had you all wrong, Steve. I'm, I'm really sorry, mate. It's all right. Your comments uh, woke me up. Morning! <laughs> Are you using humour to deal with an emotional moment, Daniel? <laughs> well, yeah. Um, was that funny, was it? Well, humour is convenient for masking and avoiding emotion. However, if it's somebody else's emotion, then it may not be appropriate. All right, Mum. Can we please keep Mums out of it? If only we could. I doubt that's possible, Amy. Why do you say that? Mum won't leave me alone, especially since I've been coming here. Why is that? Well, maybe she's worried we'll take you from her. That's a relevant point Stephen makes. How does that sit with you, Amy? She's tightening her grip for sure. She phones all the time and won't stop talking. I left on the phone, made a cup of tea, and she was still talking when I got back. <laughs> and she turns up without warning, just barges in. Um, your mother has keys. Ever since the last time I was ill, she says she has to have them in case I do something stupid again. How do her fears affect you? It's like she's waiting for me to kill myself. It makes me worry I will. It's months since I tried that. Well, months isn't a long time. It sounds like she's worried for you, but it sounds like you feel cornered. Cornered is a good word. She shouldn't have keys. She'd go mad if I asked for them back. Then change the locks. You don't know what she's like. I'd never hear the last of it. She came in yesterday, pulled the bedclothes off me, and made me get up. Oof. It was horrible. First thing in the morning? Well, no, it was afternoon. I haven't been getting up bed much lately, apart from to come here. Did you have a go on Don't it? Don't be silly. I sat there like an idiot till she'd gone, then went back to bed and stayed there till Jenny brought me here today. She's waiting outside in the car. Well, perhaps we need to consider boundaries, Amy. Boundaries? Okay. You also mentioned your staying in bed a lot. Can we talk about that? <sighs> I can't manage getting up.
I'm getting all these emails from my old job asking when I'm going back, and voicemails from friends, but I don't know what to tell them. I was like that too for a long while. Not feeling pressured by other people can help. Is that useful, Amy? Yes. It's an opportunity to really find yourself away from other people. I hadn't thought of it like that. I usually just hate myself for not being able to cope. Well, you can speak to your friends when you're ready. If I say the word depression or anxiety, they'll freak. Listen, when I was diagnosed bipolar, it had to explain my mood swings to people. Oh, well, that was until you said I was BPD. Borderline personality disorder. It was like they didn't know what to call me, so it was, oh, let's call them that. No, we call them that. Now we're calling that. Now let's call them that. Oh, I was like that too. My things kept being misdiagnosed. I, I didn't see how it helped. It helps doctors know what meds to prescribe? Well, personally, I think you can get trapped in a <coughs> diagnosis. When I first took my emotions to a doctor, I wanted to be told what I was. I believed in an external system that was almost all-knowing. It would know more about me and my true nature than I did, which seems ridiculous to me now. But I just wanted an explanation for the pain. At least a name, a label. I became an illness that wasn't mine or me. Trapped in some so-called professional's definition of what I was and what I was experiencing. Such is the fluidity of human consciousness that it can latch itself onto any story or narrative and completely assimilate itself, becoming it. I did. And the longer a label is used, the more profound its effect. It becomes familiar, feeling like a part of oneself until recovery becomes unthinkable. Today, Luke. Oh, that's not, it's just me out. Well, it's quite obviously bandage, which will naturally draw our attention to it. What's well, just me arm, me? What happened? It's fine, really. It doesn't look clean. It's okay, really. Fine. It's seeping. Will you leave it? Okay. I hurt myself. I was upset. Did you do it on purpose? What do you think? Why were you upset, Luke? Because Mary came round hassling me to score gear again and I told her, like I keep telling her I'm not into it anymore, but she wouldn't let it drop, you know, telling me she still loves me and getting off at me and I love you, Luke, he came round, yeah, yeah, I'm, she, I mean, I couldn't help myself. I get it hard on when the fucking wind blows since coming off the gear. So she's going on and on and on till eventually we'll go out and score some gear. But I did not touch it. I did not, honest. And she fucked off. After she got what she wanted, she was gone. And it was so quiet. And I felt so... <clears throat> I don't know, I felt... I felt used. I felt tired, I felt hurt, but mostly I felt fucking angry and I wished I'd kept some of that fucking gear back. And so I started smashing the place up, I'm throwing furniture around, and the lad bloke comes down and he's banging on the door and yet I was making that right bloody racket. And you shouldn't have let her in, bitch. <sighs> let, let Luke continue, Amy. That's it. You were telling us how you hurt yourself. Yeah, well, um, see, after she'd gone, I told the landlord that everything would be fine, but then I've got to be really, really quiet and I've got to creep round and I've got all this shit building up inside me and you've got to release it. So, um, I self-harmed. There you go, that's it. 
You mean you cut yourself? Yeah, if you like. That's very dismissive, Luke. The term self-harm seems abstract, and that's quite a violent thing you've done. Yeah, well, you see, um, <clears throat> I haven't done it for ages, so I was just a little bit pissed off with myself. Well, maybe being with Mary stimulated old behaviours. It may not always seem like it, but you are making progress, Luke. But you know what, though? You should clean it. It might get infected. Look, will you just bleed and drop it with your whole caring thing now that your whole sick family's dead? I can't believe he really said that. <laughs> First, I just want to check, Luke, that you understand what I mean when I say you're making progress. Yeah. So, what were you laughing about, Daniel? I think it was nervous laughter. I, I, was, I was asking you, Daniel. Just Luke's bloody cheek, he's so dark. You find Luke's darkness funny? Well, yeah, I did at the time. It's just I don't know what else to do sometimes. Laughing's close to crying, right? But it's not crying, is it? It's true what he said about caring. It's weird having no one left to look after. No one at all? Dave, my fella. No one else? No. Oh, what about you, Danielle? Oh, her. She's all right. She don't need looking after. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Please, not... It's easy to achieve. <laughs> not Whitney Houston. Anyway, look what happened to her. She's hardly an ad for it, is she? <laughs> <laughs> she should have been in this group. <laughs> you know what I mean? Seeing Luke's injury reminded me of when I used to self-harm and <clears throat> strangely made me miss doing it. That's mad. It's something I used to do to escape from emotional stuff. But... What about the pain? I can't imagine doing something like that. Oh, no, it took me out of the emotional pain I was in and into my physical self. It felt more peaceful there. So how did you stop doing it? Well, it's been a long journey from then till now. Lately, I've been doing a lot of creative stuff. I do art. I try and write every day. And I avoid stress. I don't have a troublesome ex, for example, and I avoid my family. Can you avoid your family forever, Stephen? Uh, I intend to, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good news, mate. But you live with them, don't you? Unfortunately. But I don't speak to them and they've given up trying to talk to me. I had to be very determined. God, if I lived with my mum, I wouldn't have a minute's peace. Look at the state of you. It's like you've just given up. You can't just give up. I never did. You've got to pick yourself up and damn well get on with it. Nothing comes to you in this world I should know. Mom, I've worked damn hard all my life to give you the opportunities I never had. For what? You just lie there. You won't even open the curtains. You don't even see the light of day if I'm not here. All these opportunities you've had that I never had. What good's it doing you, eh? eh? And what are you going to do with your life? What on earth are you going to do with your life? And when are you going to stop all this nonsense? I know you've got to cry to your, 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 your psychological group, whatever nonsense it is. Blaming me for everything, when all I've ever done is give you every chance I could. And that Jenny of yours, it's not natural. I know they're all turning you against me, and for what? You just lie there day after day after day, and all I can think of day after day after day is that one day you're going to do something stupid again and terrify us all. Well, if you really meant to do it, you would have succeeded. It's the most selfish thing I've ever seen. Remember the boundary thing you mentioned a few weeks ago? How do I do it? 
Does anyone have any ideas about this? Tell her you need time alone. Impossible. She gets weepy and says I don't love her. Then I feel guilty and take it all back. Well, this may be best done in small steps. Is there any way you can choose when she visits without seeming to reject her? I'm nervous just thinking about it. Well, perhaps pick a specific day of the week. Offer to make a lunch, for example. Considering my cooking, that might even keep her away. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's a good idea, though. I mean, it puts you back in control. How did you get your parents to leave you alone? No, oh, it's different. They uh, weren't that interested in the first place. All right for some. And how are you feeling, Danielle? All this talk about family oh, when you lost sorry, I didn't. Yours. No, it's fine. I mean... Well, I do miss them, and it was hard, especially the illnesses. But what can you do? What you do is self-medicate. I was doing that way before they got ill. But when I was caring for Mum and things got hard, I took extra antidepressants. It improved our life together a lot. She was on them too. Prozac. Mm -hmm. Happy pills. I never liked them. Being on them felt artificial. Like I wasn't in touch with myself or life. Unlike Stephen, I'd agreed to group therapy so I could keep taking the pills. But after some months, I felt ready to stop. I wanted to feel life's pleasure and pain and highs and lows. Of course, I was lucky those lows didn't take me where they take some others to a pain so acute that the only way out might be suicide. But I couldn't help wondering if given enough time, the therapy I was receiving might help them too. Beginning to feel wasn't easy. I slowly cut down to a quarter of my dose and was hit with a grief so deep that I just couldn't face it, unused as I was to emotion. So I increased the dosage again. The next time I tried to cut down, I was scared to go out of the house. And there were drug come downs after coke now, which Prozac had comfortably eased. Then there were weird withdrawal symptoms of dizziness that seemed to go on and on and on for so long. But eventually, eventually, I succeeded. And as the chemicals left my system, parts of myself resurfaced, some painful, some joyous. I'm better than they don't care. 
way I'd come to the group. Really and honestly, I don't see the point. It helps me deal with Mum, but even if she leaves me alone, then what? Nothing. None of it makes any difference. I talk about her in the group because I can, because it seems the thing to do. <coughs> Mother problems, classic therapy stuff, right? But nothing quite cuts through. I'm not touched by anything. I hear what the others in the group are saying, but it doesn't mean anything to me. Just voices in the void. I'm cut off and when I wake up, it's like, do I have to do another day? Do I have to go through it all again? I'm tired of it and I often think of just ending it. I don't let the therapist know how much. <laughs> you know, the last time I tried to kill myself, I had four seizures, and I'm still here. Well, you sound disappointed. Failure is failure. It's humiliating. I had a stomach pump, and it was revolting. At the hospital, Mum said, we're never going to talk about this again. I really, really wished I'd succeeded. My mum was like that when I told her I was bulimic. That's interesting, Danielle. You haven't mentioned bulimia before. Oh, yeah, I know. It's not quite as significant. Overeating and chucking up is not quite as significant as people trying to kill themselves. Well, you kept that one quiet. But I'd like to come back to that. But first of all, Luke, do you want to speak more about your suicide attempt? <sighs> Mary had just left me. I was still waiting to get therapy. I was on all sorts of medication. Plus, I was doing smack. But that was ages ago. I'm better now. Okay, well, if these feelings resurface, you can bring them here to the group, okay? So, Danielle, we just broached on the subject of your bulimia. I must be really relaxed here to have brought it up, Oof, so to speak. I mean, even my best friends don't know about it. Well, they probably do now. Um, kept a secret from all my boyfriends, always carried a toothbrush and paste. You mentioned telling your mother. I was 17, we hadn't heard of it then. When I told her I was spending all my money on food and then throwing up, she just said, don't be ridiculous. That was the end of that. It's not surprising you haven't wanted to share it since. It's more that it's disgusting. I mean, it's not remotely glamorous, is it? Is, is glamour more important to you than inner well-being? Well, yeah, it has been most of my life. I mean, that's my upbringing. Looking good was important. Being slim, wearing plenty of makeup. Tell me about it. You should hear Mum going about my hair. She was chasing me around the flat with straighteners. It was like Tom and Jerry. And she wants me to wear makeup to make my skin look lighter. I'd like to come back to that, <laughs> Amy. But first of all, Danielle, are you still making yourself sick? Well, not often, no. I mean, I used to go on these huge binges in a kind of a trance. I never would have thought you'd do that. Oh, well, thanks for looking so disgusted, Amy. Well, it's not very nice, is it? Look, I don't look disgusted that you stay in bed all week, do I? Sorry, Amy. Sorry. OK, I made myself sick this week and I felt vile. I've been arguing with Dave. I've been angry with him all week. I think we should split up. Being angry doesn't mean you should split up. That's, that's quite a leap, Danielle. Yeah, and I bet you're fucking terrifying when you're angry. No, I bottle it all up. Well, it seems you're connecting your bulimic attack with repressed anger. Why are you angry? I'm doing everything. I'm bringing home the money, I'm doing the housework, I'm doing the cooking. You sound like my mum. Actually, I sound like mine. She was furious the whole time. Used to crash around the kitchen to make sure we all knew about it. Is it true you do everything? Yeah, he just sits there. You said he had a new job. Well, yeah, he does work quite hard. Hang on a minute. Does he even know why you're angry? I used to get this from Mary before we were into the gear heavy. Like, she'd come in and she'd start banging around, and I'm like, what's up, love? And she'd be like, saying the word, not saying the word, like banging around a big, big, big <coughs> tense jaw on her and smashing doors. And I'd be like, the fuck? Well, come on, what's going on? And eventually she'd go, you didn't do the washing up. And I'd go, what? The washing up, if you want me to do the bleeding washing up, I'll do the washing up, it's just, it's just something I don't think about. Exactly, men. Exactly, <laughs> women. 
I'd like to bring this back to your mother, Danielle. What was she like when she was angry? Well, we lived on top of my parents' pharmacy. You lucky bitch. Actually, it did have its perks, especially for her. She used to rattle. A bit like you, then. Oi! <laughs> so she'd spend all day working in the pharmacy, run upstairs to put the dinner on, rush back down to the shop while my dad sat there in front of the telly, with, behind the paper with the telly on. She got more and more wound up. Aren't you doing the same? Copying a familiar pattern? Like Luke said, if you just explain to Dave, then... Yep, because we're not all mind leaders, you know. Yeah, you could try telling him. I'm imitating my mother. God, say it's not true. The word familiar means like your family, and what is truly familiar is what we grow up with, and sometimes we relive that without realising it. So maybe my mother was imitating her mother, who was a right, strict, selfish old battle axe. you better stop it before you do it to your kids. I'm not having kids. Don't you want kids? No way. Mummy, Mummy, look, I'm dancing. Stop it, will you? I'm busy. Will you stop showing off? No one wants to see you prancing about. No, I don't want kids. I'd love to have kids, if they ever get my head sorted out. This is about how you experience your own life, not how it might affect the life of your child. Uh, Amy, how does this relate to your mother trying to make you whiter? Her mum was light-skinned and used to scrub her skin to try and get the colour off. Jesus, no wonder we're all fucked up. <laughs> Mum says her main regret in life is not having skin three shades lighter. Fucking hell, we are fucked up! Jesus. It's called transgenerational behaviour. We pass behaviours and unspoken assumptions about life down the generations. So, if an ancestor, even a great-great-grandparent, experienced, say, domestic abuse, we might be echoing that in our own lives, even in a small way, be replaying that pattern. Grandmother's footsteps, she wore a broom. All these years later, I can feel how she moved. Kitchen to table, a table to bed. Just doing you, then I change. 
NA meetings didn't keep me off gear. But talking about stuff, you know, hearing what other people had to say, made me feel better. Because where I grew up, you couldn't have feelings. <laughs> no, it was all um, girls and shagging, footy. <laughs> you didn't have a sensitive side. Even my mum was hard as nails. Oh, just brush it under the carpet, lad. I suppose I'm a bit like that too. Because the stuff I couldn't bring to share in this group. Not yet, but there's plenty of time. See, that's why I wanted therapy so much. You know, for a while, all I cared about was getting a fix, my next fix, in the future. Corner shop and back. I'm getting better now, I'm more ambitious. I'd like to get back into music, actually. Oh yeah, I'm, um, I'm a pretty good drummer. So it goes. I was in a band once. A good band. And um, we got signed up. So I went out and got wasted. I blew it. And they went on tour with a replacement. He wasn't as good as me, but he was more reliable. But I am, I am getting better now, yeah. You see, if I can stay off this gear, I'll get the money to get a new kit. I mean, you know, I think I've still got it. I've got what it takes. And, you know, music doesn't half help with depression. Yeah, it fucking does. I mean, I still get, you know, some really heavy black days, you know, and that heavy shit just really sits on top of you. But sometimes for weeks, and I am getting better. Yeah. And getting therapy, it's like a victory. It is like something is going right. I'm the therapist, and therefore I'm not obliged to reveal any personal information about myself. <laughs> <laughs> backing out four weeks. I called her early when she wouldn't expect it and said, would you like to come over for lunch on Wednesday? It sounded like someone else's voice. There was this long pause and she said, but I'm coming over in an hour. And I said, get this, I said, I have things to attend to today. <laughs> there was a silence and it was so hard not to just say, okay, see you in an hour. My heart was pounding so hard I thought she'd hear it. And then she just agreed. <laughs> so I've invited her to lunch. It feels major. Woo! Oh, congratulations, Amy. That's wonderful. It really sounds like you're starting to take control of your life. But, but be vigilant because it's very easy to fall back into old patterns, which is probably something your mother will want. But we can check in about this weekly and well done. Well, my week wasn't as triumphant. It was for my dealer, though. <laughs> Straight after last session, I went on a coke and ketamine binge for three days. I even did smack. But I did not play one single game of online Scrabble all week. What? Yeah, it's like a compulsion with me, did you not know? I do it all day sometimes. Like, all day. Like a, another drug? Well, it's more a distraction from thinking or doing anything else. Sounds disengaged. It's actually nerve-wracking. I play timed games against real people, so the seconds are ticking by while a stranger's waiting for me to have my go. That's meant to be fun. I spend my life avoiding that kind of tension. Really? How? Not getting out of bed, or answering the phone, or checking my messages. Yeah, but don't you worry they're important? <coughs> Most of the time. Well, then you're living in a state of constant tension, too. If we grow up with tension around us, it seems almost comfortable. We uh, recreate it. So, what happened last week? Maybe you're right. Nothing I can think of. But it's strange that it happened straight after therapy. You know, maybe it's fear of change. I don't know how you can do drugs. Don't you feel out of control? No, it's the opposite. I can take a drug to relax more, to feel more awake, to feel 
sleepy, to feel happy, to feel sexy, to feel... No pain. Look, the urge just takes me over sometimes. But a lot less lately. Sounds like you're becoming more able to experience your emotions. And I've cut down on the antidepressants. I'm definitely feeling more. I cried thinking about my mum the other day. And I started writing again, which I barely did when I was on the meds. It's a huge challenge for me being in the group. I've never been talkative. Perhaps it was scared out of me when I was young. Before one-to-one -one therapy, I was in a bad way. Drinking a lot, cutting myself repeatedly, and getting my thrills from shoplifting, of all things. I know I, I seem quiet now, probably straight-laced. I'm here to learn to be social, but I'll probably never fit in. Then again, considering how far I've come, who knows? It's hard for me. When they look at me, how can I know what they see? How can I share what's deep inside? The truth I've always had to hide. Not sure if I can ever let it shine. Marked with all my darkness bars I pull down my sleeves to hide the scars In long shirt sleeves on a hot summer's day Still I change and yes I grow As new life begins to flow In time these scars will surely fade away
Stephen, you mentioned growing up with tension around you. Would you like to speak more about this? I was speaking generally. It wasn't your experience then? I suspect it's most people's. I was asking you. All right then. My mother was unpredictable. I never knew when I'd get breakfast or be told to fuck off. And my father would suddenly explode and get violent, so yes. You could say I grew up around tension. I thought it was normal, as you do when you're growing up. See, I think my upbringing was quite normal. That's why I can't understand why I'm like this and the way I've been. Which is how? Putting myself in dangerous, abusive situations, not caring for myself or making the most of myself. All those years that I've wasted when I had so much more potential. Danielle, this is the first time you've voiced dissatisfaction with your lifestyle. When we first met, you said you were fine, that drugs were fun, and even though it was dangerous, your sex work suited you. This seems significant. observed by a hidden camera. Not that you're paranoid. Hey, <coughs> real paranoia is not funny, it's terrifying. Sorry. Why is it that people chuck that word around like a joke? It's like OCD. They say you're OCD if you like the washing up being done. Not guilty, your honour. Oh, of course, <laughs> my lad. We'd never see you in the kitchen, would we? Oops. 
I'm afraid I've got some rather shocking news, so I'd like you to all prepare yourselves. As you know, we started this process as an ongoing group, safe in the comfort and knowledge that we'd be meeting weekly for the foreseeable future. However, there is a change, and it is soon. We have three more sessions together. You're joking? No, I'm not joking. Our funding's been cut, and we can't continue. I will be leaving, and the group will close. Is this a test? No, it, it's not a test, Daniel. When have I ever tested you? It's real. But I feel like we've just started. Well, there are other options available. You can all apply for CBT or other short-term therapies via your GP, but I'm afraid this type of long-term psychotherapy has been cut, and there is nothing I can do about it. Do they know how fucking long it took me to get therapy? Do they know how many times I've asked, no, not asked, begged for help? I've laid on the floor crying over and over again. And I will not do it again. I cannot do it again. You know what? I'm fucking sick up to here of doctors thinking they are so superior. Like I'm this big and there's some sort of God with my fucking life in their hands. And looking down on me because I haven't had a wash or a shave in a week or a job in I know fuck long. I went there over and over and over again. And the whole dehumanising system is fucking depressing in itself. I cannot do this again. I'm, and do you know what? I don't want ABT, CBT, or any other bunch of fucking letters that they are going to throw at us. Because you know what, peeps? Do you know fucking what? That is shite that they just palm you off with. Shite! I like it here. And they're going to take it away from me. I'm so sorry, Luke. We still have three more sessions together to round things off, and maybe in some way that will be a useless process of learning how to say goodbye. Oh, I can't deal with this. This is shite. Break, right, so take it easy. I know how it works. I'm going to be round in five.
using heroin and the sleeping pills that he was prescribed. I was feeling bad about it anyway. Poured a glass of wine at the end of the day when the phone rang late. Begin to shine. I let it grow for we had time to take it away. It was a wicked crime. I held the glass and I me. I blame myself for the hollow way you threw your life away. I remember your eyes starting to open to a world of hope and dreams unspoken to see yet another promise broken. to shine I let it grow for we had time to take it away it was a wicked crime I held the glass
more accepting. So let's stay optimistic and keep talking about this so that long-term individualised treatments are available for everybody and so that people feel it's safe to speak out. So anyway, what about little old me? When therapy ended, I'd started to change. I'd started to take more care of myself and to realise the ways that I wasn't. I didn't know why it was happening, but it was. And when I felt low, I'd sometimes write, or draw, or go for a walk. Not always turning to drugs or online scrabble. But why had I lived as I did? Did I just want attention from a too busy mother? Did some buried memory teach me self-hate? There was no secret key to explain it all. Things went better than they had before, but still at the very last minute, I'd spoil them. Although, maybe in subtler ways. I tried one-to-one -one therapy, but couldn't afford to continue. And I asked myself again, Is this hardwired into my brain? Can I ever change? I could get by in life doing ordinary things, but this hidden darkness I couldn't dispel. Some things helped me through. Integrated body psychotherapy connected me with highly relevant memories and helped me to heal. And I discovered five rhythms. A therapeutic system where you dance your ass off! complexes. Now, I've been practicing this routinely, routinely, for some time now, and I feel like something's changing. I mean, dare I say, I may have stopped standing in my own way. I mean, I'm here, aren't I, doing this, with this amazing lot. Believe me, that's progress. <laughs> 